Thanks, team. Good morning, and welcome to the May Breakfast Forum, our final forum of this season with the topic, Environmental Health, Is There Justice for All in Our Public Health Response? My name is Kathy Norleen, and I'm the host for the forum today. Just remember, we've got a few housekeeping items. Um, this is a Zoom meeting, and we will be recording the meeting today. It is your choice whether or not you have your camera on or off, but we do ask that you please keep yourself muted during the presentation. American Sign Language Interpretation Services are being provided for this meeting. You may use the chat box at any time to ask questions. And if you need help, you can email info at mpha.net. <clears throat> we start all our MPHA meetings, thank you, with our ancestral land statement. We ask that you take a moment to honor and acknowledge that we are on ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe. Indigenous people have a long-standing history and connection to the land since time immemorial and our original stewards of lands and waters. Many American Indians were forcibly exiled from their lands because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism and US governmental policies, but they persevered. We make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota and Anishinaabe people, ancestors and descendants, as well as the land itself. So before we start, I'd like to take a minute to thank everyone, all 30 friends of the forum, and they are listed here. And next, um, a huge note of thanks to all of our forum sponsors, once again listed on this slide. Check out the MPHA website if you're interested in becoming a friend of the forum or a sponsor in the next set of forums, which will begin in the fall of 2021. So I'm very excited to introduce our moderator for today's forum, Dr. Ed Ellinger. Many, if not most of you are familiar with Dr. Ellinger and his work. He is past president of Minnesota Public Health Association and former commissioner of health for the Minnesota State Department of Health. He is also past president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials, or ASTO. He labels himself as a public health metaphysician, someone concerned with understanding the nature of being healthy as individuals, a community, and society, along with the conditions that create health. He has assiduously worked to bring inequities to the forefront of public health in order to advocate for more equitable health systems. It is a great pleasure to introduce you and take it away, Dr. Allen. Thank you, Kathy, and good morning, everyone. You know, they had a poll at the start, of, you know, what are the days of the, in, in May that we celebrate? You probably don't know that today, the first Friday of May is also National No Pants Day. And let me assure you that I do have my pants on. Um, it has a different meaning. It started back in the 80s, but you know, with COVID and Zoom, I, you know, it's much more, it's less of a big deal right now since many people have no pants day. Uh, but anyway, regardless, uh, thank you, Kathy. Particularly, Kathy, thank you for your leadership of MPHA over this last year. I love what you've been doing. Um, I particularly appreciate your president's messages uh, that, that that we see every month, uh, both in content and style, and the fact that you you know incorporate poetry in there every once in a while. I think you've just done it, done a really good job. And having been somebody as president of MPHA and working with Lisa Pogoff back in the day when we had paper newsletters, I know how hard it is to put the newsletters together. So I really like what's going on with the, the newsletter that we're doing. Lots of really good information. So it really says that you know, MPHA continues to be vibrant and engaged and relevant and taking on really important issues. 
Uh, so those of you who are, I see lots of you know familiar names on the, the chart, but I think there are some new names. So this is a, for the young folks, this is a great place to, to get connections, to advance your career, develop your leadership skills. So really get involved with uh, you know, MPHA. Uh, so all of the work that MPHA does really is advancing public health, which is you know, what the Institute of Medicine says, what we do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. And since today we're talking about environmental health issues, have to remember the fact that it was in 1974 that the Minnesota Environmental Health Association broke away from MPHA and set, divided, developed its own organization. And, and certainly I've been working and encouraging people to bring those two back together again in more effective ways. Um, you know, they function fairly separately and I'm not even sure what if the membership overlaps very much, but we need to do that. Uh, so that's just as a way to get us started in what we do collectively, because all of these efforts are needing everybody to move forward. Now, if people have heard me talk before, you know that I, I believe that there are four existential threats that are facing us right now. <clears throat> Certainly one is nuclear holocaust, which I grew up with, but is still an issue today. And this just happens to be the anniversary of two nuclear tests, one above ground on Christmas Island, in 1962 and one underground in Nevada in 1982. And the last nuclear test was in 1992 and not that long ago and we still are dealing with that issue. So that continues to be an existential threat. Certainly COVID pandemics are an existential threat, but also as you're well aware, climate change is an existential threat. And I believe that inequities are also an existential threat. If we don't deal with inequities, our society will fall apart. Society as we know it will fall apart. So we're going to be addressing two of those existential threats today, climate change and, and, and environmental justice dealing with inequities. Um, and I want to acknowledge at this point in time, which I just found out, and maybe other of you have known this, but I acknowledge the death of, death, uh, death of Deb Swackhammer who is really one of those advocates for environmental health and environmental justice and has been a, a great contributor to um, MPHA over the years. So I, I acknowledge her passing and, and grieve her loss. Now, the issue that we're dealing with is really current. Uh, just looking at the Star Tribune over the last week, uh, we, these are just four articles that I heard. Minnesota state parks could close over clean car impasse. The omnibus environmental budget won't pass unless you know the governor gets rid of the clean cars. You know, I would think, okay. Uh, also, there was one, a new normal US temperature goes up. Our temperature has gotten two degrees hotter within the last two decades, or has gotten hotter by a degree in the last two decades. Then another article came on, people of color exposed to far more air pollution. And it, the, the author from the University of Michigan says, it doesn't matter how poor, it doesn't matter how wealthy, the racial disparities exist for all African-Americans and other people of color. Environment is affecting people, particularly people of color like they've never done before. And as a side, I chair the HHS Secretary's Advisory Committee on Infant Mortality and, and we're putting some recommendations forward at the end of June, and we have a section on environmental contributions to maternal and infant mortality that we're going to be forwarding. So this is a huge issue. And then, then lastly, there is an article in the Star Trib a commentary uh, that about the Hennepin Avenue bike plans and, and transportation plans. And I thought this was interesting. So I'm going to quote uh, Carol Becker, who wrote this, uh, this commentary. She said, most bike lane users are white men. Women commute on bikes one third the rate of men. Black people commute on bikes at one third the rate of white men. Only wealthy people have the luxury of choosing climate change over jobs. Families with children, especially families of color are disproportionately affected when you make travel difficult because they make so many more trips. Is it more important to fight climate change in this way or help parents and children? Is it is it more important to worry about the preferences of white male travelers or to create jobs that lead to economic justice, end quote. Sort of a challenge out there. So we need to come to grips with these different approaches with these different issues or, or make peace with them because we're facing those. So I, I have this quotation from Archibald McLish, 
who is a, whose birthday is today, he wrote JB, which is a, a, a play about Job. He said, as things are now going, the peace we make, what peace we seem to be making will be a piece of oil, a piece of gold or money, a piece of business, or a peace in brief without moral purpose or human interest. We got to come to peace. We got to come to grips with these things. But how are we doing it? Are we doing it with a economic model? Are we doing it with a social justice model? That is one of the things I hope we talk about today. And we've got a great panel to do that. We've got Marguerite Mills. You got her 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 bio uh, linked in the chat. She's a geographer and artist, and she's doing a mapping prejudice project. And she says deep mapping approach. I hope I find out what that is, focusing on the intersection of property and housing as a critical juncture for interrogating structural oppression and material inequality. Interesting statement. And then we have Ben Passer, the lead director of, of energy access and equity at Fresh Energy. Uh, they advance equitable outcomes across Minnesota's energy system. He's an attorney working on a just carbon neutral economy by mid-century. A big challenge. And I think we'll hear more about that. And Kristen Robb, who is the director of the Minnesota Climate and Health Program at MDH. And I thought it was interesting that she thought that, that her biggest contribution was the working with the uh, Lake Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa on expanding the narrative about tribal health, about rice. And I think really that is we're an environmentalist working on narrative change, I think really important. And I also like the fact that she's a landscape arc, a degree in landscape architecture. So we have a really diverse panel. So I'm going to give each of the panel members five to seven minutes to give us a little background on what they want, they're thinking about. Let's start with Marguerite and then we'll go to Ben and then to Kristen. So Marguerite, take it away. It's all yours. All right, thanks so much, Ed. And uh, thank you everyone for having me. I'm, I'm glad I don't have to follow uh, our other panelists. Um, I'm really excited to hear um, their perspectives um, and also questions from the audience, um, partly because I'm, I'm not a public health professional, uh, nor do I typically sort of situate or categorize my work as environmental justice. Um, I typically locate my research and organizing and activism in the realm of housing justice. Um, but I am really grateful for the opportunity today to talk about and think about why housing justice is a matter of public health and environmental justice. Um, so I'll give a little bit more about me in case you're wondering um, from, uh, you didn't get enough out of my bio, but uh, I've been a researcher with the Mapping Prejudice Project for the past three years, um, and I'll sp speak more about what Mapping Prejudice does and our research in a little bit, but um, I'm also an activist and an organizer um, with unhoused folks in the Twin Cities area, um, and I recently, with a group of other organizers, founded the Twin Cities Housing Justice Research Collaborative back in January. Um, but I wasn't always a geographer. I have a degree in developmental psychology and I had a career in that field for half a decade. Um, and I approach my work now a lot with the same framework that I learned then. Um, I have moved away from looking at individual centered work, but I'm still really focused on development. Only now I think about how places develop over time rather than individual people. Um, and I make maps and I tell stories uh, that use space and place as the central organizing framework for understanding the current conditions of inequality, uh, really through this lens of historical oppression and exploitation. And I believe that housing justice or housing injustice is one of the central concerns when we talk about public health and when we talk about environmental justice. Uh, I think most people are probably familiar with this adage of zip code as destiny, which I think is a reductive but catchy way of just saying that everything is connected to where you live, where you call home, everything is connected to the very particular and intentional history that underlies that place. And often when people talk about the importance of place in health um, and any number of measures of life quality and outcome, um, they're thinking and talking about uh, the conditions of what that place looks like right now. Um, 
but I think more and more people are recognizing that it's the generations of history that are informing the conditions that we see today. So like rec we can recognize that areas are segregated today, uh, that some areas have less access to food, um, have less green space, have less tree color, truck cover, um, are literally hotter than other places in the city. Um, that police are more violent in some places um, and that there is more environmental contamination. Um, the list goes on and on. Uh, but the question is why? And when we look at this question from a historical and a geographic lens, the answer time and time again is that intentional policies, practices, and actions from people with power, from white people, have centered or have created that landscape in our, in our cities. So the project that I'm a part of, uh, Mapping Prejudice, is an example of doing the work of asking why. Our project is devoted to identifying and mapping racially restrictive covenants in geographies across the United States. Um, and we started here in so-called Minneapolis. Um, and just a little background on what racially restrictive covenants are. Um, they're a particularly salient example really of why housing is so important when we think about health. Racial covenants quite literally were black and white examples of uh, the ways that white supremacy and settler colonialism were built into the housing system. They were just a few sentences that were inserted into property deeds that excluded people of color from buying, owning, renting, or even occupying property that they were attached to. And they worked exactly the way that they were supposed to. Racial covenants were tools of racial capitalism that segregated cities and they coded spaces as white and by elimination, they coded some areas of the city as not white. And once these racial lines were drawn, they were used to construct all sorts of institutionalized practices around this racist schema. Um, and they were really preceded uh, in, in many ways, uh, sort of their, their, uh, their legacy uh, follows that of coercive and abusive treaties. And all the aspects of spatial differentiation that I mentioned earlier, proximity to food, green space, pollution, police, police brutality, we've been able to show and find that they follow these durable lines of this historical practice. In, in Minneapolis, around 75% of white families own the home that they live in, while only 25% of black families own their home. Uh, black and brown families are not only systemically shut up, out of wealth accumulation through home ownership, um, but this arrangement is also enriching capitalist landlords, white landlords, and BIPOC people are the target of harmful evictions, which are detrimental to health and safety. BIPOC folks um, who do own their home here uh, have a significant chance that they're owning a home that was historically redlined, making it worth an average of 25% less um, than the median home value for the city. And historically, covenanted homes are actually worth an average of 15% more than the median home value. So another example of how this inequality is, um, is both a detriment to uh, communities of color and enriching um, white neighborhoods. Last summer, a census taken at Powderhorn Park placed the chances of being homeless here for white people as one in 1,250, while black people had a one in 100 chance of being unhoused and indigenous folks had a one in 50 chance of being unhoused. We struggled to even get porta potties for folks at encampments last summer during a global pandemic. The history of racism in housing impacts people at every point on the housing spectrum and historical practices like racial covenants undergird the entire system of housing. And this system was built and still does enrich white people. So it's extremely difficult to change, but this is why we need as much effort and attention as possible to ensure that all people have a safe and healthy place to live regardless of race or money. All right, thank you, Marguerite. That was excellent. A lot of food for thought. Um, I really appreciated the fact that you actually 
used your developmental psychology and expanded it to the development of communities, the development of, of geography, a development of place, and also bringing in some of the other characters of history and geography and political science. It really highlights the fact that you are a public health person because you're working on what we do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. So thank you for being part of this. Uh, ben, you're up. Great, thanks Ed and hello everyone. Um, I'm uh, really excited to be here. Uh, great to hear from Marguerite and also looking forward to um, hearing uh, from Kristen uh, this morning as well. Um, so I'm Ben Passer, uh, Lead Director of Energy Access and Equity at Fresh Energy. Um, just brief background on our organization before I get started. Um, Fresh Energy is an independent energy policy nonprofit based in St. Paul and for nearly 30 years, we've been working to shape and drive bold policy solutions to achieve equitable carbon neutral economies. Um, so like Marguerite, I'm not a public health professional, um, but as Ed mentioned, um, I'm an attorney by training and I work on energy policy every day. So um, in my five to seven minutes here, um, I'll be doing my best to really illustrate the intersection between environmental justice, energy and climate and public health. Um, so first to level set, when I talk about equity in my work, I refer to it as having two main components. Uh, the first component is the elimination of barriers to full participation in the process. And the second component is access to the full benefits of the outcome. Um, so the emphasis is really on both process and outcome. Uh, this definition is intentionally broad and intended to reflect the different levels of investment, whether time, information and education, or financial support that may be necessary to realize both of these components in practice. So with that uh, equity definition in mind, um, I just wanted to tee up some background information about what we know about air pollution in our communities. The most recent Minnesota Pollution Control Agency greenhouse gas inventory shows that transportation and electricity generation are among the highest sources of air emissions in the state. On the other hand, the residential and commercial sectors things like our homes and other buildings are at the lower end of the emission spectrum in Minnesota relative, relative to other sectors, but have actually increased over time. We also know from several recent reports, including from Rocky Mountain Institute and UCLA's Fielding School of Public Health, that things like gas appliances in homes can present dangers to public health through increased indoor and outdoor air pollution. These gas appliances, such as gas ranges in your kitchen or furnaces for home heating, present a number of pollutants like nitrogen dioxide and PM 2.5, among others, in the home. In a state like Minnesota, where more homes are heated using natural gas and propane compared to the national average, this is a real concern. On the transportation side, we know that internal combustion engines in all types of vehicles, diesel burning trucks and buses, and simply the number of vehicles on the road contribute to higher levels of air pollution in our communities. And as Margaret, Marguerite touched on, uh, we know that those vehicles are more frequently traveling in communities of color and under-resourced communities due to uh, historical legacy around discriminatory policies. But drilling down a bit deeper, uh, it's important to recognize that air impacts do not affect everyone equally. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency has pulled together a number of great maps and tables that show that under-resourced communities, renters, and communities of color are disproportionately exposed to higher levels of air pollution. One such figure uh, shows that in Minnesota, Asians, Hispanics, Native Americans, Blacks, and those with rent under $700 a month live at significantly higher air quality risk levels compared to those who have a home value over $250,000 or are white. Another figure from MPCA shows the proportion of communities that are likely to live near higher levels of air pollution above recommended risk guidelines. Strikingly, that's 46% of under-resourced communities and 91% of communities of color. I think it's also important to recognize that these same communities have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, an acute public health crisis on top of the chronic public health issues presented by air pollution. Equity also matters because of a principle known as energy burden or the percentage of household income that goes toward energy costs. For reference, a reasonable or average energy burden is roughly two to 3%. But data from Ro researcher Roger Colton and his team show that the lowest income Minnesotans face even higher energy burdens, up to 34% of their income. That's striking when you consider that that 34% refers solely to energy costs and doesn't factor in other basic necessities such as food, transportation, and healthcare. 
We also know that home ownership is also a major factor affecting household energy burden. A 2016 study from the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy found that renters consistently face higher energy burdens than those who own their homes. That's a meaningful finding when you consider that renters don't own their homes and thus are often unable to make decisions about energy efficiency upgrades and other ways to lower their household energy costs. For all of these reasons, it's critical to consider equity when we think about opportunities in the context of environmental justice and the clean energy transition. Fresh Energy has been proud to celebrate a number of equity-focused achievements in recent years, successfully working with Metro Transit to introduce new all-electric bus lines on a route that serves communities with some of the highest air pollution levels in the Twin Cities, working with utilities across the state to expand their energy efficiency programs, benefiting under-resourced households and renters, and securing critical consumer protect protections for customers during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're also working hard now to preserve and advance Governor Walz's Clean Cars Minnesota proposal so that more Minnesotans have access to affordable, clean electric vehicles. But what other opportunities are there to scale and sustain solutions that achieve equity and justice with a focus on public health? Well, one example that I'd like to leave you all with is the work of Green and Healthy Homes Initiative, which is based in the Baltimore area. They're doing great work partnering across sectors with hospitals and healthcare systems to braid multiple funding streams and help pay for energy efficiency upgrades and health, uh, health and safety related retrofits in homes. The reason this partnership is so effective is because the healthcare systems have seen the benefits of reduced costs from emergency room visits and related expenses related to asthma attacks and other respiratory illnesses. In other words, it's proven more cost effective for healthcare systems to proactively fund energy efficiency upgrades than reactively cover the cost of emergency room visits and other uh, medical expenses. I won't go into all of the project details and positive ripple effects from this type of partnership right now, but I think it's a great example of breaking down silos to address complex issues. Importantly, Green and Healthy Homes Initiative engages directly with the occupants of these homes and apartments throughout the process from start to finish to understand their needs and priorities and help them understand the benefits of the energy efficiency work being done. So with that, I just wanted to close with one last reminder of our definition of equity. It includes both process and outcome. And with proper consideration of both of these components, we can help ensure that we're creating healthy and equitable communities for all. That's all for me. Thank you for your time. And I'll look forward to continuing the conversation with you all this morning. Thank you, Ben. A lot of really interesting and important information, uh, particularly now when the uh, Biden administration is really working on infrastructure. And so it'll really be interesting to see how those infrastructure dollars both do improve the environment, but also are they done with an equity focus? And I'd, I'd appreciate it if you could put your definition of environmental justice in the chat, because I think that was uh, you know, food for thought and I wasn't able to get all of that. Uh, and I'll also be interested in our conversation about the, the clean cars, given some of the controversy at the legislature uh, to be determined. All right, uh, Kristen, you're up. All right, wonderful. Thank you, Ed. And thanks everyone for um, participating in the forum today. I'm excited to um, hear from all of you and your questions and the panelists have been awesome and it's really nice to meet them. Um, I'm gonna take a slightly different tact um, than the other two panelists. Um, I'm gonna center my comments around one of the questions that the panelists were provided to think about in preparation for today's forum. And that question is, what has been a wake up call for you regarding environmental justice? And this is just a super intriguing question to me. And my work with the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa on a health impact assessment or what we call HIA really opened my eyes to better understanding the strengths of government in forwarding environmental justice and its weaknesses. So just as a little background, the Fond du Lac Band approached the Minnesota Department of Health to perform a health impact assessment on the sulfate standard that the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency was trying to promulgate. So sulfate in the water affects the growth of wild rice or in Ojibwe that's monomen. And monomen is a sacred food and medicine for the Ojibwe. It's not only a very nutritious food, that many of the tribes of Minnesota have access to. It's also a very significant spiritual uh, um, 
it has very significant spiritual and important, uh, cultural importance, sorry there. And um, it's used as an offering for feasts and ceremonies. And Minoman is also part of the Ojibwe origin story. So they were told in a prophecy that they would find their home in a place where food grows on the water. So this is just an extremely important medicine food for their culture. Anyway, MPCA was considering changing the sulfate standard so that at least in the views of the band and the research of the band, the sulfate standard would be less protective of monomen. So the Fond du Lac band asked the Minnesota Department of Health to do a health impact assessment so they could really document that relationship of monomen to the health of the tribe. They wanted to use the health information from the HIA to ensure that the sulfate standard would remain protective of monomen. So let's just say MPCA was not wild about MDH performing a health impact assessment on a sulfate standard that they were trying to enact. So this did actually cause some tension between MP MPCA and MDH, but we were ultimately able to continue because the mission of the Minnesota Department of Health is to protect the health of the people. And one of the ways that we do that is by providing information on health impacts to various populations in Minnesota so they can make better decisions. What we did right in this situation, meaning MDH, is that we kept our involvement in the HIA to just technical assistance. So we didn't own the final document, so we didn't have to get approval from the different state agencies. And then FDL, so the Fond du Lac Band, could speak with their own voice. So the HIA was very successful in raising the concerns of the Fond du Lac band members about the importance of monomen to their health. And it also elevated ecological and cultural knowledge. But interestingly, it failed to sway MPCA's decision because they said that the creation of these standards did not allow for this type of information. So my takeaway from this experience it, was that health impact assessments are a really great tool to raise people's voices, especially in EJ communities. And they're really helpful to document and legitimize not just the science, but also community knowledge. And state agencies can provide technical assistance to help communities really stand in their own power and be their own voice. But if the rules that we're working with are broken, we really need to change the rules of our system so they can stop perpetuating these inequalities. But just to wrap up, if you're wondering what ultimately happened, the judiciary branch knocked down MPCA's rules. And one of the reasons was because MPCA did not fully take into consideration FDL and other tribes concerned about the standard. And I look forward to our conversation. Oh, Kristen, you you make my heart flutter because one of the things when I was commissioner, I said public health is not, despite all of the good medical care we've got and the good public health stuff that we've done classic, we're not making a difference in, in health equity. And so we need to do our work differently. And you just really started to show how we can do our work differently. So I really appreciate that because uh, that is what we're going to have to do. And so that, and actually this wasn't planned, but I, I, this leads to my first question for our, our panel. Uh, like I said, today is the birthday of, of Archibald McLeish. And he said, he had this quote, quote, what is wrong is not the great discoveries of science. Information is always better than ignorance, no matter what information or what ignorance. What is wrong is the belief behind the information the belief that information will change the world. It won't, end quote. So for our panel, you know, what else needs to change in order for us to change the world? What do we need besides science and data? And Marguerite, you're, you brought in a whole variety of things. Let us know, what do you think? What else needs to be in, brought in besides science and information and data? Yeah, I think that's a really uh, great question um, 
to start off with. It's one that as someone who does a lot of, you know, work in popular, popular education, I try to grapple with a lot. It's uh, this idea that, you know, it's, we don't just have a knowledge problem, we have an action problem. And how do we move people from, you know, acknowledgement of, um, you know, even if they're willing to acknowledge systemic inequality, are they willing to take action over it? Um, you know, I mean, in the vein of what I um, am bringing to the table around housing justice, I'm, I'm pretty uh, um, strong advocate for things like rent control, for things that you know, really um, kind of piggybacking off of some of what Ben was talking about in terms of um, burden, cost burden for folks. Um, if, if I had no idea that the cost burden around utilities was, or energy was for some folks, even 30%. Um, you know, traditionally we're talking about your housing should cost 30% of your income. And if you're already just spending that on uh, electricity, that's, I, I don't know how you can do that and maintain health in the rest of uh, your life. Um, so, I mean, I think, um, and also kind of uh, to what uh, Kristen was saying, communities finding power in their voice and rising up together. Um, there's a lot of really good examples of communities coming together and asking for what they need. And one of the big things that I see coming out of community is a need for things like rent control, a need for things like more public housing, a need for there being more ways for people to access healthy places to live, so. Yeah, well, that, that brings, but those are policy changes, but how do we make those policy changes? Like the clean car thing, and so I want Ben to, how do we develop the political will to do something independent or above and beyond the science and the technology and the data that we have? Ben, your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Ed. I'll, I'll maybe briefly touch on clean cars and then, you know, I, I wanted to also echo, I think, what both Marguerite and, and Kristen have touched on. Um, I, you know, I think with an example like clean cars, um, which is, you know, a statewide uh, rule that would essentially just give more folks the option to purchase a, you know, a, a cleaner, uh, more affordable electric vehicle. Um, you know, I, I think that the the important factor is really ensuring that we have uh, support from a wide range of communities and constituencies across the state. And, you know, I think we've seen um, kind of the, you know, the political opposition from folks who are looking to preserve, um, you know, the interest of, of fossil fuel companies. And, uh, you know, I think it's really just showing that this is something that Minnesotans do want. And, um, you know, that just takes showing that, you know, in greater Minnesota, there are opportunities to really um, ensure that electric vehicles are meeting, you know, uh, folks needs in, in those communities. And, you know, that it really is not forcing folks to buy an electric vehicle, it's just giving more folks the option. And, I think just really building out that broad base of support and really communicating the benefits to, uh, you know, just the market, but also to folks' health. I, I think oftentimes, you know, um, health and, and really the impacts on public health are treated as kind of hidden costs. They're not really factored into uh, everyday life and, and really, you know, frankly, folks' pocketbooks. And we don't take into account the actual financial impact to everyday life of air pollution, of transportation costs, things like that. And, you know, I, I think if we really start talking about, you know, more electric vehicles on the roads means healthier communities, means hopefully reduced economic impacts for everyday Minnesota families, um, you know, that that's, I, I think, a really compelling message. Um, so I think that's really something that we're uh, working to, um, you know, try to to help contribute to that that sea change and 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 you know that change in perception. Um, I just really briefly wanted to talk about, um, you know, I think what Marguerite and and Kristen both spoke to, um, but you know, I think other things that are important are intentionality and resources. And you know, I think Marguerite really illustrated uh, when intentionality can be leveraged in a in a bad way, in a malicious way, um, when redlining and you know things like the interstate uh, highway system, you know, literally ripping apart communities in the 1900s. Um, and you know the importance of intentionality in making policy change and really being intentional about anticipating un, uh, you know unintended consequences, but also 
hopefully reversing disparities or preventing, uh, you know, worsening of disparities as well. Um, and I think resources are important to really bring folks into the process, as Kristen touched on. Um, you know, the more resources that we can dedicate to really bringing in under-resourced communities, marginalized voices, and ensuring that what we're working on is actually benefiting them, uh, you know, the better outcomes that we achieve through the process and the better outcomes for everyone. Um, so I think, you know, intentionality and resources are two of the things that I really try to emphasize in my work. And I think Marguerite and Kristen did a, a great job touching on as well. And Kristen, you work in an area where which is rife with this, the fact that information and data are not making changes, climate change in particular, you know, part of the title of your work. Uh, and then you also identified the, the weaknesses and the strengths of government. Uh, in that perspective, Kristen, how are you seeing, you know, where, how do we get beyond the data and the science to actually make some changes? How do we develop the political will to make the, the big changes? You had a little bit of example up in the, in, with Fond du Lac, but how do you put that into practice more broadly? Yeah, thank you. Um, I loved Ben's comment about intentionality because I think that's so important. And, you know, a few things came to mind as we were talking. One, we really need to systematically look at government policies and with a health equity lens and do some work internally. And Ed, you were a big part of that at the Minnesota Department of Health, uh, really trying to make sure that the work that we do is always under a lens of health equity. Uh, and that's kind of from a government side, but from like a community side, I think um, the point about bringing resources to communities having more community engagement is super important. There's just, there's a tremendous amount of misinformation out there. But I think the clean cars uh, rule is like one of these perfect examples. This is just about giving people more choices. This isn't taking cars away from people. This isn't telling them they have to buy an electric car. It's none of that. It's like, let's just get some more cars here electric cars and, and the fact that there's so many people opposed to this tells me that the communication is just, it, we're not communicating in a, way, in a way that's reaching the people we need to reach. And granted, there are some people that are never going to listen to whatever we have to say. I mean, that, that's just a given, um, but we're, I think we have a real lack of communication where we're, we're not expressing the importance of the things for health that we need to do. And, and I don't have a, a silver bullet for this, but I, I think that, um, you know, I've been in public health for a while and communication has really just risen to the top as a very important component of our work. And I'm just seeing it now even extremely more important <laughs> You know, just it needs to be more emphasized because that is where we start changing the hearts and minds of people is through that communication, and then and then doing the work on the ground, working with communities, building communities, and just elevating their voices. I think those are the ways that we make significant changes. Thank you. Good, good comments. And you raised the issue of community engagement, and so I have this another quote from Archibald McLish. He said that particular disease of intellectuals, that infatuation with ideas at the expense of experience, that compels experience to conform to bush, bookish expectations. We're so intellectual, we're so data focused that all of our focus looks on that. How do we engage communities in a meaningful way? How do we get local communities to have their voices heard? How do we have the lived experience be part of our conversations as just as valid information as the randomized control trial or the PM 2.5 data from North Minneapolis. Ben, why don't we start with you? Thanks, Ed. I'll, I'll be really brief because I would also love to hear from Marguerite and Kristen on this uh, before we uh, move on to the next part of our agenda. But you know, I think one example that I love to highlight um, is the work of uh, Facilitating Power and the Movement Strategy Center. It's a guide known as the Spectrum of Community Engagement to Ownership. And you know, I think it's really focused on you know policy making, decision making spaces. But I think there's broad applications of of this type of guide, and it really I think walks through. Um, what I think we usually think of as, as community engagement, but is actually not true community engagement. You know, things like input or kind of feedback gathering, things that are 
uh, you know, rather transactional or, you know, one directional. And it really encourages folks to move toward uh, what they refer to as community ownership, which is really, you know, working with the community from the beginning of the process using things like memorandums of understanding and, you know, community driven principles to actually allow community members to drive the process themselves. Um, and so I'll drop a link into the chat if folks are interested, but I think, you know, that guide is a really great resource to think about how we move from well intentioned, but maybe, you know, not exactly, uh, you know, true community engagement to how we can actually, you know, empower communities to make their own decisions. Margaret, your thoughts on how do we bring in that community experience, that lived experience in, in our policy making, in our program development, all of those factors. Yeah, I think it's a, an extremely important um, thing to consider. Mapping prejudice has been um, always particularly concerned with community engagement as a strategy for mm, putting process above uh, kind of output. So um, one of the things that we talk about constantly and one of the things that I've been fortunate enough to be uh, responsible for is our, our the way that we actually collect our data is not through um, kind of traditional academic means. We're not just like sitting in a in our lovely sub basement in the University of Minnesota libraries um, looking at records, but uh, going out into the community and asking uh, community members to help us actually collect this data. So this has been an opportunity for us to bring people together to actually create the maps that we're making and reckon with the history together um, and then create sites of uh, conversation and uh, community involvement and ownership over this history and this map uh, by both creating the data and also recognizing all of our roles in it, uh, both uh, folks who are have been generationally impacted by these policies and also those of us who are um, reckoning with our complicity in these policies and working to own that and do something about it. Um, so I really think that the that there is more attention being paid. I'm super grateful for Ben um, uh, putting this uh, resource in the chat. Love would love to take some a look at this. Um, but I think it's right that there there has been some lip service paid to community engagement, um, and I'm I'm hopeful that we can kind of together create more strategies that are actually empowering community voices to speak up about what is needed in community, and to your point, Ed, uh, really taking the lived experience of folks as important input, not prizing quantitative data over people's lives. And, and Kristen, you work in with health impact assessments. And my understanding of health impact assessments is that the community is engaged in the scoping of the, you know, the range of things and the questions that are going to be asked and the issues that are going to be raised. And you certainly did that with the, with the, the, the band up in, in Fond du Lac. Is that an example of one way of, of getting you know, that community, that lived experience into some of the real studies that are going on? You're totally stealing my thunder. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Um, no, um, health impact assessments are a great way of really uplifting the traditional knowledge, lived experience. Um, you know, our process was really just to guide them through the process. They were the the tribe themselves made the decisions about the what they wanted to explore. They made the decisions of what data should be included. They made the decisions of how are we going to understand these outcomes? How are all these things connected? Um, so it's a really it is a really wonderful way of uplifting those voices. I will say, however, again to one of Ben's points, which I just thought was really good, there has to be sort of this involvement and equity in the process, but there needs to be that equity at the end, the outcome. And that has been one of my little frustrations with health impact assessments is that they've been really great about the process, you know, real good about engagement, lifting people's voices, lifting non-traditional knowledge or, or science, which I think is really important, but we're not getting the, some of the outcomes that we really want to see, you know, at the very end of that, you know, tail of the HIA, we did get the outcome we wanted, um, but that doesn't always happen. And so I'm really interested in how do we get these outcomes? Process is important, but at the end of the day, I wanna say we made a difference. 
So, it, and that's challenging. I don't have any answers for that, but but I think that's a really important point. Oftentimes it's more important to raise the questions than to have the answers. And so that's what we're going to do now. I mean, I hope this has just been a fascinating conversation in this 15 minutes that we've had to, to chat. Uh, we're now gonna go into to breakout groups. Uh, I think uh, Lindsay is gonna send people into breakout groups and you're gonna have about 15 minutes to chat and raise some issues and raise some questions and, and see what stimulated thoughts in your mind. So Lindsay, I send it over to you. That's right, thank you so much. Yes, in just a minute here, you will be invited to join a breakout room and uh, you and the folks in that room, please identify someone to record a question and come back and share that with me directly. Um, you have a few minutes in your breakout rooms and then we'll see you back here in a little bit. Thank you.